So, Shani, thank you so much for being here at Christ for the Nations. I want to start with some light things. What's, are you interested in sports? I am interested in sports. Favorite sports team? Oh, no. See, I actually like playing sports. Oh. I, I watch people. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know what? Let me just say my husband is a football fan, and he watched the Cowboys last night. I actually drove by the stadium. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, guys. He was just watching, okay? So I was driving by, and I was like, there it is. You're watching it in Israel, and I'm not watching. I'm just driving by. But, uh, yeah, so I, I don't actually have time to watch sports. I do apologize. But um, I do have some very, very avid soccer fans on our team in Israel. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So yeah. did you play sports any at all? I did. Okay, I did. which, which uh, one? I played basketball, did track and field. Uh, track and field? Some field hockey. And, yeah, volleyball. Volleyball? So, yeah. Favorite movie? Favorite movie. Oh, I have to confess this? Okay. <laughs> Confess uh, it. <laughs> <laughs> um, favorite movie? You know, my daughter asked me this the other day, and I was like, I guess I would only pick my favorite movie by a movie that I've seen more than once. But uh, honestly, anything in the Marvel verse. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I did put my limits on Doctor Strange too. Didn't didn't go out for that one. Yeah, that last one, that no, last one was no, terrible, wasn't no, it? No. It was. Yeah. I so did not like it. Yeah, I'm, mm -hmm. I, I like sci-fi. I, I stop at the, you know, the, the witches that want to send you to hell type thing. Yeah, that kind of thing. Sorry. Okay. I know it's in a different universe that they're doing it, but it's still, yeah. All right, what about favorite food? We're just trying to get favorite to know food. her first. Favorite food. I'm, I'm a big fan of the shawarma. Shawarma, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Bias. Uh, what's oh, a shawarma? No, no, I know shawarma. I'm saying I know you. cultural bias. Cultural no? bias. I'm just teasing Oh, yeah. You. Well, it's just you get meat and you get fresh salads, and it's, yeah. and it's like very readily available in Israel. So, but I'm a very big pasta fan as well. Yeah. Travel destination, favorite place that you've been? Favorite place I've been. Okay, my favorite beach is Galveston, Texas. I know, I know. You need to I go know. to Jamaica, no, Galveston, no. Texas. I, yeah, look, you I live in Israel. What am I going to say, the <laughs> Holy Land? No. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why for all of you haters out there, okay? <laughs> because I'm a desert creature, which means it doesn't rain in the summer. And when I went to Galveston, Texas, it's this long, straight beach with nobody. Okay, I live in a country where everyone's like this, okay? Oh, There's okay. nobody there. And it rains, and I'm drinking Starbucks coffee, and I'm like, this is a beautiful moment, okay? So all of you have these beautiful Jamaica vacations, which I can't afford to go because I'm on the mission field. I, okay, okay, it's all right. One of these days, you guys can send me there, and I will tell you all about the Caribbeans and how much I love them. But in the meantime, although Switzerland, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan. In fact, when I went to Switzerland, I had a revelation <laughs> that when God said he gave us the promised land, that's all he meant. It was the promised land. Not the best land, just the <laughs> promised land, okay? So Switzerland is, yeah, definitely up there. Are you a Netflix, Netflix fan or not? Uh, honestly, when it comes to Netflix, I only watch if I'm on a, on a run or something. Oh, I can't, really? like, sit and watch. Yeah. And I pretty much just try to figure out what it is my kids were watching and check up to make sure it's not too terrible. So that's, oh, that's, that's right. the extent of my, <laughs> sorry. No, no, that's fine. You're, yeah. you're busy. What about favorite book? Favorite book. My favorite author is Michael J. Sullivan. Okay. Oh, who knows him? You. I want to talk to you at the end. Okay. <laughs> no. He's, he is a New York Times bestseller, but he wrote a trilogy called The Rayo Revelation. Not a believer, but really an incredible author that I felt had this wow storyline that was very pal parallel to the church and Israel, and so he entirely unintentionally did it, but it was one of those moments of like, yes, this is, this is, yeah, someone who understands history and how history develops and how stories change, you know, when we tell it from generation to generation, so uh, that, that, and of course, C.S. Lewis. Oh, love C.S. Lewis. Have you ever read The Four Loves? I love that book, The, the four, four Loves. The Four Loves? Yeah, by no. C.S. Lewis, The Four no. Loves. You need no. to read that one. Okay. It is exceptional. Okay. For, uh, have you yeah. guys read The Four Loves? Yeah. Revolutionary. So uh, full, full disclosure, I don't actually, I'm a writer for a living. I don't actually read because okay. I don't have time, but I do audiobooks. So anything that I can find um, audible, I, yeah. I devour in terms of C.S. Lewis. Oh, okay. Um, your passions, what are your passions? As we're getting to know you, what, yeah, what would you say, these are my passions? My passion. Um, 
My passion is my team and my family. I have five kids and a husband at home. Uh, and uh, I have a team of 20 Israelis uh, that are, make up the Ma'oz Israel team. Uh, we also have offices around the world, and I love to see them grow into who they're going to become. That's really like the thing that makes me the happiest when someone comes from the outside and they're like, I know so-and-so, and ever since they've been involved with you guys, they're just blooming as a person, blooming in their gift. Um, so that's something that makes me very happy. And of course, music. I was about to say that. I'm like, I where mean, is singing in all of this? People things. first, projects later. Oh, uh, come on. I like yeah, that. Yeah. I like that. Um, so, yeah, we have a recording studio in Jerusalem, and uh, we have a team of 20 Israelis that are that work in media and music, um, essentially really have a vision to see the restoration of modern-day Levites or modern-day psalmists um, writing worship in Hebrew, also Arabic, um, and really want to see the, the Holy Land filled with worship. And so that's something that's very much a passion of mine. Passion for yours. Okay. What about idiosyncrasies? Because we all have those. We might have the passion. Well, we, we definitely have passions. But the idiosyncrasies, those unique things about us that, you know, really defines who you are in a unique way. What are those? Um, or one or two? I would say one of the ones that gets mentioned the most is that I sound American, but I'm not. <laughs> And so inevitably, um, I mean, I'm born and raised in Israel. Uh, in the fourth grade, my parents flew to the States. We actually stayed here at CFN for two years. My, my brother went to a special school because he was dyslexic and ADHD. And he was in the fourth grade and couldn't spell his name, which was three letters. And so uh, he came here. And during that time, I lost my Israeli accent. Oh, really? Um, which has been uh, both a blessing and a curse in terms of my credibility as being a ministry leader in Israel and saying I'm Israeli, and they're like, no, you're a And then I don't know the American social rules, and so inevitably I say something, and they're like, that is the rudest American I've ever met. I'm like, no, no, I'm a nice Israeli. I'm not a rude American. So uh, that is something that, that is uh, noted often unintentionally. So apologies ahead of time if I say anything from up here that's like, why did she say that? Well, you're good with the accents. I mean, for you to... Have I, to I do special for you. It's really, it's good, good. American, lovely country. We love you, Israeli. Israeli <laughs> special. <laughs> that's good, isn't it? Yeah, that's good. All right. Um, tell me a little bit about you being the granddaughter of Gordon and Frida Lindsay. You have... You know, you were born into a family that's well-known, well-established, beautiful history, rich legacy. How do you feel to be a part of that? Was it always good? Did you, were, were there points in your life where you wanted to run from it? Yeah, how did you respond or react to that reality? Right. Um, so I would say when, when we grew up, because I didn't grow up on campus. I grew up in Israel, and then in the summers we would come and visit uh, which again was this back and forth culture shock and we were the barbaric Israelis that didn't have any class or anything. Um, and we just called this grandma's school. We're like, we're going to grandma's school and we don't know a whole lot. Of course, everyone's so much older. But uh, then, uh, interestingly enough, when I graduated high school, I didn't, I didn't come straight to CFN. Um, I, you need to repent. Uh, you did no, I did, I did eventually end up here. <laughs> but there was a revival going on in Pensacola, Florida. And, um, and I went to school there, and I actually learned more about my grandparents there really? than I did just growing Because, you know, when it's family, you're feeding, and you're, you know, stop hitting each other, and, you know, that's the conversations. And then I go over there, and they're teaching all this stuff, and there's, like, all these books that if you go to the footnotes, it's like Gordon Lindsay, Gordon Lindsay, Gordon Lindsay, Gordon Lindsay, because he, he documented so much of what was happening. He was so involved in like working together and collaborating with you know different people, which was a big no-no back then. It was like, you do your own thing. If someone from a different denomination, you don't talk to them because clearly one of you guys is going to hell. So like, it was just, it was just this very kind of uh, separatist kind of uh, attitude. And he very much wanted to work with all sorts of people, so, and he, he was a writer as well, and he documented a lot, so I gained a real appreciation of the impact that he had outside of the circle of CFN when I went there, yeah, so, um, so yeah, so basically at that point, um, when I finished there, then we came here and spent uh, two years doing the 
third year worship uh, school right when it was getting started. Uh, and got to spend some time with my grandmother, um, knowing that, you know, at some point I wouldn't have that. So that was very, very special time for me. And um, yeah, so I, I really, on my dad's side, my, my grandmother was from Russia and my grandfather is from India. And so I know I came out white, but it's, it's <laughs> all, uh, my brother came out you dark. Know that. You're yeah, Indi- I tan Indian. well, I tan well, I do. Um, <laughs> But we don't, we don't actually know what my dad was because he grew up an orphan and he's got curly hair and Indians usually have straight hair. Anyway, so we're kind of like somewhere in between Africa and, and India is, is our origin. Um, but in any case, uh, I was never close to my family on his side because he grew up so disconnected from them. Uh, and so really on my grandmother's side, that was I only ever had one grandmother. So it's like, how do you even beat that? Like, my only concept of a grandmother is someone who never retires, is always, like, doing something, is known to everybody else as mom, you know? Um, and, and still she found time for us, which I really appreciated. Uh, yeah. What have you taken from their legacy that you're walking with in your present life and will, you will take in your future with you? Any gems? I like to call them, you know, spiritual gems that you say, whoa, I saw that in my grandma, and I want that in right. my life. Yeah. Um, I think the biggest thing that I've taken away that has kind of been passed on to my parents and um, I think also to um, the rest of the family is that our, we understand our destiny as helping other people reach their destiny. And really, just even the concept of pouring yourself into having a school where other people are coming and training and, you know, growing into who they are is what we're supposed to do. It is our destiny to see other people. So that's why I was saying even early on, like, when I see people that are, I'm working with and they're, you know, I, you know, people have different giftings and mine is seeing potential in people. I can be like this. Like, you just did this. You just said something about putting screws in a drawer and that I just know that you're going to be good at X, Y, Z, you know, that's, <laughs> which I do that with my team and they're like, you knew that back then when I said this? I'm like, yes, yes. Um, so I think their ability to see potential in people and want to pour into that and really um, receive joy out of seeing other people shine is something that uh, I've always enjoyed. Um, I really appreciated seeing my grandmother, you know, it's not that they never owned a home, they did, um, but she did not need earthly things. Like, she had stuff that she loved, she had a nice couch, and she had pictures, and she had all this stuff that people gave her from all over the world. Um, but she, she just, you know, when I, I, I don't fault other people for having nice things because I, you know, you see Solomon and you're like, God bless Solomon. And oh my gosh, did you guys ever read what he did with his like throne with the six lions? So there's like, there's nothing wrong with someone who's successful on that end. But when I saw, you know, all these ministers from her generation with these huge grandiose things and she's living in this rented apartment on campus and she's fine with that. And I'm just like, that's just cool. That's just cool. Well, that's good. Let's give it up for mom Lindsay. Yes, it's true. I was amazed when I came here years ago and I saw that too. I thought, whoa, she's living on campus just like all of us. I was totally impressed with that. So I can just imagine how you felt. Um, Talk to me a little bit about your past in the sense that I know you're you're a minister in with worship and you're reaching the nations, but we all have a testimony. We all have something before the anointing fell upon us and God is using us mightily. Uh, I don't know it, so if you can touch on that just a little bit, what have you walked through? Any brokenness, any, any wounds of your heart that you had to hold on to God, find God in the darkness is what I like to call it. Right. Um, that's a, it's a bit of a long story, so I'm going to try to summarize, but overall, so growing up in Israel, I'm going to kind of try to give you that, the, this is going to sound very grandiose, but just to give you context, My generation, um, my parents immigrated to Israel in their 20s, my mom in her 20s, my my dad in his 30s, and that generation had children. So when they immigrated to Israel, there was a handful of believers in the whole country, Jewish believers. I'm not talking about Catholics and, you know, all the other people that built those weird things. Anyway, (laughs) um, sorry, did I say, is this online? No, it's not. 
But my generation was essentially the children of those who immigrated. The first generation of Jews who were believers who were born and raised in Israel in 2,000 years. Whoa, that's context. Okay, so we had no role models of how to do this. My parents didn't have any model of like, how do you raise believing kids in Israel? And we didn't have any role models and how do we like understand who we are as people. Um, so it's, you know, all your friends are secular. I had one believing friend in Jerusalem and one up north and I saw them twice a year. So like once in one holiday and once we'll pass over here in Sukkot, you know, in Jerusalem. Um, Sukkot is the Feast of Tabernacles. And uh, this is before phones and faxes and, <laughs> yes, I said before faxes. <laughs> um, before my time. Before internet, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so there, we did have telephones. Okay, let's let's not get to. But it was very expensive to call in, and so the uh, the process of growing up and developing a personality and your social skills and finding someone who will, you know, you can even talk to about the Lord and how you're chasing the Lord together and how you know different struggles that you have and questions that you have didn't have that at all, um, and so I think. Uh, Somewhere around my teen years, it was really this abrupt shock of we, we moved to the States for two years, and suddenly I'm in this Christian bubble. And mind you, when I say Christian bubble, I know that it was all sweet, but as an Israeli who didn't understand Christian culture, I got in trouble all the time for saying all sorts of stuff. And I'm like, what? I don't even know. It's like, they're like, you spend a lot of time on the fence, like at recess, right? They put you on the fence when you're in trouble so you can watch everybody else play. Because the best thing to do with a kid that's causing problems is not give them any time to get their energy out. You know, just make them stand there. And anyway, um, so yeah, some of you guys that got there, you're like, huh? No, that is that is kind of dumb. Um, anyway, but the the thing was is I went from I'm the only believer in my school and I'm proud of it. And I will tell you that I was born twice. Let me tell you in Hebrew, saying you were born twice sounds just as dumb as it just, you know, not, not born again, you were born twice. And then my teacher would come and be like, can you explain to me this, you're born twice thing that your parents are telling you? And I'd have to sit and explain and then they'd call. And, uh, and then I come to the States and I go into this Christian bubble where everybody's a believer. And, um, but nobody really understands my culture. So my, my fourth grade teacher, when they had the parent teacher meeting, she's like, your daughter is very, um, so, Jewish, you know? <laughs> I was like, what does that even mean? <laughs> like, what do you even define as Jewish? I think she just meant rude and, and wild and barbaric. But anyway, um, so it was just, just so you understand why I keep saying that. In Israel, let's just say in the States uh, or in Western culture, when you want to honor someone and show them respect, you want to make them feel good, right? Yeah, that dress looks great on you, even if it doesn't, you know, like, yeah, that's, you're, you're gonna do a great job, even though, you know, they probably won't, like that kind of thing, right? So in Israel, we honor you by letting you know what we really think, right? <laughs> and it's, that's our way of saying, I care enough about you to let you know, no, that dress doesn't look good on you, but you could look great in something else, let's go find something. So in any case, in, in this, this, Dallas culture, they didn't so much appreciate that. They thought I was trying to be rude. In any case, um, so I go from two years of this bubble back to you're the only believer in your city uh, right around 12 years old. If you guys remember what 12 years old was like, it's not a good time to, to make that shift. So I would say between 12 and 15 was a very significant crash and burn. Um, so you, you, crash and burn, let me pause you right there. So, in a very detailed detail sense, did you, like, renounce your faith? Did you, um, you know, vacil va vacillate? Vacillate between. Vacillate the word. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, between both. Yeah, what was it exactly like? Um, you know, it's, it was three decades ago, so I'm, I am trying to remember. But it was definitely a time where I wasn't sure what I thought I remember a moment in which there was a girl that knew me from the second grade when I was super bold and super, you know, like whatever, and I would just talk about the Lord all the time, and she's like, she sees me, I think, in the seventh grade at this point. I was like, I don't know. I don't want anything to do with anything, and um, I think a lot of it just had to do with I didn't understand what it meant or what it looked like to be a believer as a teenager, 
and there was no other teenager believers around me. So it was like, I don't want to be the only person that's like believing in whatever this thing is. Um, and so I remember this girl walking up to me and be like, you're really different than, you know, you used to be. And I was like, oh, okay, you know, whatever, like, whatever. She's like, so you still believe in God? And I'm like, no. And it was just this very distinct moment of like, Ooh, ouch, I just said that. Like, I just said that out loud. Um, so, uh, yeah, so it was, it was definitely like a time where uh, there was no real support. There was no youth group. There was, no, there was just nothing. So, um, of course, there was my praying grandmother and my parents. <laughs> Um, you came back. Tell me about that. I what did come you back, back, right? What Which, was that experience that brought you back? So interestingly enough, um, I got kicked out of school in the ninth grade. And uh, <laughs> um, everyone that knows me now, they're like, what? You? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I had my moments. My brother was just so much worse that I think it was a surprise to everybody when I <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you must know him. <laughs> um, he was just a tornado. I mean, he's like 40-something <laughs> now, and he's still a tornado. But um, he's, just, he's really just a genius, brilliant. And so if you've ever been in the room with a brilliant person, they just, they, you don't even exist, really, because they, like, exist on this upper echelon of... Feet up there, yeah. yeah, picture being in the room with, with Elon Musk, and it's like, do you, have, do you even have a conversation with him, or is he already on Mars? So um, anyway... So I, my parents were like, you know what, we want, we want to send you out of Israel for a year. Give you a break. It is very spiritual. How many of you guys have ever been to Israel? Okay. Uh, how many of you guys have ever been to Israel for more than just a tour? Okay, so you would understand this. Israel is, when you go on a tour, we ha you generally experience what we call tourist grace. It's beautiful. It's amazing. You're getting all the, like, angels singing and the holy <laughs> and, like, Jesus walked here. And, like, no, it's legit. It's, like, you got the tour, taking, tour guide, like, taking all the hits for you. You don't even know what's happening, all the chaos. You're like, you, seriously, it's just, like, your room. There's air conditioning. There's food. There's shawarma. Yeah. And, um, and then you come home, and you ha it, like they create this space for you to experience something that is beautiful in the Holy Land. If you live in Israel, it's a very different experience. It's a very difficult culture, which I just remotely described. Even when you're trying to be nice, like it's hard. So just think when you're not. Uh, and then you, it's spiritually intense. It's ground zero of everything that's ever gonna happen and culminate is there. And you're feeling the intensity of like Islamic trying to, you know, come. There's this battle over who's gonna be worshiped on this land that God said he really likes. And so of course, if God says he really likes something, then the devil's like, you can't have it, you can't have it. So there's this constant intensity that you're just growing up around constantly. So they were like, you know what? You might do well to go country. just take a break. Take yeah. a year, take a break. And so they sent me to East Texas. Oh. Okay. Uh, yeah. Was that, what, was that YWAM? East Texas? No, it was not YWAM. Oh, okay. Uh, it was a place called Heartlight. And really, it's this ranch in the middle of Nowheresville. And if I had trouble in Dallas trying to understand the culture in Hick <laughs> Hicksville, where there was population, two shrubs and a tree, and one stoplight, okay? One <laughs> stop. Yes, yes, okay. So it was in Hallsville, Texas. And, um, and it was basically like a year. We went to public school, and it was my first experience in American public school in high school. There's like a thousand something students and these huge. So it was a culture shock for you? It was culture shock. The problem was, is nobody explained what culture shock to me was. So I was like 20 something when I realized why I got in trouble all those times like a decade <laughs> before. I was like, I was having these moments of like, oh when you say this, it means that to them. Um, so yeah, so again, I got in trouble a lot because, and I had no idea why, and it was all that. But uh, I remember my mom saying, because every Sunday they would send you to a church. Yeah. And at first they were sending me to, I don't want to name denominations because I'm not looking to insult it, but it was basically these very boring churches. And they had these high pews, and I would always sit <laughs> like on the side because I could lean my head and fall asleep without them actually being able to tell from... Uh, from the stage. And then uh, my mom was like calling them. She's like, I really want my daughter to go to a spirit filled church. I really, it matters to me. Um, I think it's going to make a difference. And I just remember, and I was the only person that they, they found someone that would come and give me a ride every Sunday and make sure that I went to this church. And um, 
and I would uh, just experience the presence of the Lord in worship. And it wasn't like I was worshiping. I was just standing there, and it, sure. it felt like this physical embrace. I'm just standing, and it would be like week after week after, like he's wearing me down, you know? So it wasn't even like there was a moment. It was just at some point I just found myself back in the arms of God, in the arms of type God. Thing. Whoa, yeah. amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Oh, that's good. 